welcome to our FE Week Roundtable, our first digital roundtable debate, and we're pleased to host it in partnership with NCFE. I'm Shane Mann, and I'm the publisher of FE Week, and I'm delighted to chair this session. The theme for this roundtable is post-16 education planning for a very different September. In light of the ongoing situation with COVID-19, there has been a great deal of disruption across the education sector at all levels, the impact of which will be felt long into the next academic year and possibly beyond. In April of this year, in a new discussion paper published by NCFE and the Campaign for Learning, alongside Education Policy Consultant Mark Corney and Director of Policy and External Relations at Holex, Dr Susan Pemberrow BE, we were provided with a look at the likely impact of the COVID-19 crisis on post-16 education, the economy and labour markets, and outline an action plan to address the consequences for jobs, apprenticeships, youth unemployment and adult learning. The paper warns of a very different September to the one the Department for Education and the Department for Work and Pensions planned for of January of this year requiring a different mix of provision and financial support. Discussions are taking place across the globe about what the short and long-term impact could be. Since the report's publication in April, we have been provided with some additional forecasting and instruction as to what September could look like. The full COVID-19 and post-16 education planning for a very different September discussion paper is available for download at the address on your screens. During this session, we will hear from the report's authors and our contributors. The session will be segmented into five areas. We'll commence with an overview from the report's authors, Mark and Sue, and then we will discuss 16 to 17 year olds, 18 to 24 year olds, adults, and apprenticeships. But before we commence, I would like to introduce Michael Lemon from NCFE, the report's publishers, to say a few words. Uh, good, thank you very much, Shane, and, and thanks especially to you and, and ALSEC for organising and facilitating the session today. Uh, really grateful for that. Um, by way of background, NCFE and Campaign for Learning, we've published a number of policy pamphlets over the, the, the last few years, and the aim of the pamphlets is to propose workable solutions for policy makers for clearly identified problems in education and skills. The next pamphlet in a series uh, is underway and we're due to publish that in the first week of July, so, so watch out for that one. But the discussion paper that we're here to talk about today was, was a little, little different from the way that we usually do things. And I think um, obviously that's a, a result of the very unique circumstances that we've all found ourselves in. Um, at the time when we started planning the paper, the focus was, and, and, and obviously rightly so, um, from policymakers on what needs to be done for this year's current cohort of learners, those people who were, had programmes disrupted and, you know, all, all of the kind of stuff about predicted grades, um, you know, on programme apprentices, um, potentially being furloughed or made redundant. But it was clear, uh, I think, to us at that stage that we were going to need a very, very different plan in place for September whatever happened over the summer it was very unlikely that we'd be able to just go into September and do things the way that we'd, we'd always done them so we felt that there was a need to kind of highlight that and, and rather than come up with all the solutions what we wanted to do was put together a paper that um, essentially looked at everything that was going on and we're very very grateful to Mark and Susan who, who I think did a very forensic look at uh, everything across all the areas that we talked about but in um, with the information that was available to us at the time I think and obviously things have moved on many of the organizations around the, the virtual table here today um, have have released their own reports and their own contributions we've, we've now got wider uh, availability of data sets and things like that so we're starting to build a fuller picture but the, the ultimate premise of the paper was to really um, you know start that discussion because we felt that if a plan was to be implemented from September, that really needed to be in place by about June. So we're actually delighted to see that there is going to be a fiscal event in the first week of July, and that's a very firm indication that the government are looking at measures that should be in place for September. And over the weekend, there was a number of stories about specific measures, particularly for young people, which we're delighted to see, but we hope they're not limited to only young people as well. Um, 
each organization around the table can help us to build a fuller picture of the situation that we're in now and what's to come and what's ahead. Uh, and I think each organization brings a unique perspective and they may have their own recommendations for government as they plan for what is going to be a very, very challenging year ahead. And that's why we wanted to produce the paper and why we wanted to get people around the table today. And CFE and Campaign for Learning want to facilitate a wider debate. We want to discuss, discuss issues and potential solutions to test and challenge ideas, to find common ground and to propose workable solutions for policymakers. So with that in mind, I'm going to thank everybody in advance for your time and for your contributions today. And I look forward to what should be an excellent discussion. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to NCFE partnering uh, with us for our first virtual roundtable debate. NCFE and FE Week have hosted many a roundtable and debate session in Parliament and across the UK uh, in recent years. So hopefully uh, in the future, in the near future, we'll be able to hold a physical event once again. So thank you very much, Michael, for your contribution. I'd now like to invite Mark Corning and Dr. Sue Pember, OBE, to give, provide us with an overview of their report. So they're the report authors. Sue and Mark. Welcome. Thank you. Um, if I go first, I mean, I, I was delighted when Michael said to us, would we um, participate in writing this pamphlet? Um, mainly because, like many of you, I spent the first month um, of COVID-19 just firefighting. Firefighting on behalf of the adult community education providers that I represent. But firefighting in my whole mind that things needed to happen. And it was fantastic in a way to have the release of putting it down on paper. But the thing that came out to me and still comes out to me more than any other, the learning that I did by looking and researching this was actually there is no time to lose. You know, that's the heading of the chapter. And we've already lost another six weeks. Um, and young people are making their mind up now about September. So it's great that there'll be a, you know, a fiscal event in July. That means absolutely nothing um, to the 16 year old um, who is at the moment either despondent, sitting in their bedroom, you know, doing not much. Um, or to the 16 year old who felt really confident that they were going to go on to an apprenticeship and they know that that apprenticeship is on offer to them. So I'm still with that first heading is no time to lose and collectively I'd love to come away from this um, debate today with us all, you know, our, all of us, um, you know, using all the different routes that we have to say to people, come on, tell those 16 year olds there will be something for them in September. We don't have to give it a big name. We just really have to um, say that there is something there for them. And that would be a really outcome for today and an outcome for them. And um, we'll do the detail later on. But that's my one and only message, really. Um, yeah, thank you, Sue. And Mark? Uh, well, um, I I'm very pleased that there'll be a, a, a fiscal event around the 6th of July. It will focus policy uh, minds. And I think one is needed. Um, I think, though, that since the paper was published, the economic outlook is probably slightly worse. We did use the concept of a reasonable worst case scenario, and I think that reasonable worst case has got slightly more pessimistic. Um, and uh, I've been learning lots of, of, of alphabetical uh, letters and how best to describe the recession. It won't be a V-shaped recession in 2020. So I think if publication gave us today, which would have been lovely for you, Shane, but sorry, it was a month ago, we would be probably talking about this thing of a wheelbarrow type recession, which started in uh, Q1 2020, very deep in this quarter, then probably flat. I mean, that's a bit harsh, but it could be flat in Q3, but it really does focus minds. The employment market could be very, very difficult just in that key September, October period, which is so important for the post 16 sector as a whole, not just FE, but HE as well. And when we need to kick in our active labor market policies, but then it could be a long, long haul to get the economy uh, back to pre COVID levels of activity, probably Q4 2021. Now that also flags up that September, October 2021 is also going to be equally challenging. So the government is going to have to do some short-term measures, 
but which also feeds into some longer term measures. So it's available for next September, October as well. Um, a key kind of conceptual approach in the paper was really to say policies need to pivot away from probably employment and jobs with apprenticeships, and I'm a great fan of apprenticeships, towards perhaps full-time education and active labour market policies um, to see if we can shield some young people especially from the labour market but also attach others more closely. And the one thing where this is my assumption that probably uh, really needs to be challenged I had a sense and a hope that perhaps in September, October, uh, the experience of going back to full-time education, going to college, going to university, would be the same as September 2019. And I don't think that's the case. The experience will be different. And although policy makers could make all the places open, and I hope there's lots of places in HE and FE, behaviour might be that some parents shaping young people's decisions might not go into full-time education, depending how this awful pandemic uh, materialises in the future. So that's an added complication, I think, that you could challenge the paper. It was just too optimistic about what the experience of full-time education might be. September, October, it could be more different than even the paper suggests. I hope that's okay, Shane. Yeah, and I... I I, I completely agree with you and it's certainly from an economic perspective you only have to look at the data table I think it's on page four or five of, of the paper that looks at you know, initially the cost of the job retention scheme yes. which your paper lists at sort of 35 billion <laughs> which I think is way out now and at the time you were you know so those numbers were based on the retention scheme uh, lasting for, for the first three three months and now we're looking at an eight month uh, retention scheme so the numbers are a, a, a wildly out sadly now um, and I'm certain that uh, things will change rapidly over the next quarter as more information becomes available and of course it's not just the impact in this country it's the global impact. So uh, we're now going to move on to uh, our, the sort of first section of the debate which will look uh, specifically at 16 to 17 year olds um, so uh, Mark and Sue, I think you're going to provide some sort of brief introductions just for these little segments. So if you, uh, which one of you would like to provide the introduction for the 16 to 17 year olds uh, section? And if anybody uh, joining us within the room table would like to contribute, just a quick reminder to just let me know within the Zoom group chat function uh, that you'd like to contribute after their introductions. Thank you. So Shane, we've, we've covered it a bit already, but the first thing is, what are these 16 year olds going to be like in September? So, you know, are they going to, they've had the trust in the system removed from them. I know that's a big sentence, but up until now, they've had, right, we go to primary school, we're in year 7, 11, 12, you know, and we're about to, you know, we're doing, doing our GCSEs um, in year 11. Um, and then we do the exam and there's no longer an exam and all of a sudden, you know, they're going to have some, as one child told me last night, a fictional grade. The fact she's going to get nine nines, right, but she still believes they're going to be a fictional grade. And, and if she thinks like that, what I'm getting at is what are the others thinking? Yeah. And therefore, they, they're a bit despondent. So the first time they've come across, really, um, our infrastructure as a country is sort of failing them because they're not doing what they've expected. So what are they going to be like as students in September? Um, they're not like the, the year, year, year 10s where they're doing learning online. Um, so they've, had, they've done nothing. The majority of those who are doing GCSEs this summer have done nothing since March the 23rd. So what will they be like in September and are we ready for them? And then the ones who wanted to go for a job, what, what have we got on offer? Now, I think the temptation is that we'll invent something new for them in September, where I actually think what we should be doing is trust every college and every provider to do what's right by the student. So let's not spend time you know, reinventing another program for 16 year olds, but we've got enough on the, car, on the offer, enough on offer at the moment with all the sort of level twos, the BTECs, all the rest of the stuff that we've got on offer. Just make sure that they get really good advice. They're encouraged to go back in September and trust the provider base to do what's right for those students. And I couldn't bear it if we invented a new, 
um, program that had an acronym like a YOP or a TOP, right? Um, and there's only a few of us on the call that might remember them, but I was one of the people who actually taught them. They're demoralizing, they don't fit into our system. So just trust the provider base. Thank you, Susan. And I think it's a really interesting point that you made, you made early on in, in your statement around uh, what these 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds will be like, what you know, mental frame of mind are they going to be in, in terms of their own well-being, but also their approach and attitudes towards education and, and its point, I guess. Um, so rather unfairly, so the first person I'd like to sort of bring into this session is Laura um, from Youth Employment UK, who, who does a lot of work with young people. Um, so Laura Jane, what's, what sort of conversations, if any, are you having with young people uh, currently uh, at this time around their, their sort of attitude and frame of mind towards continuing their studies come September and beyond? I wonder if I was here from the Youth Employment UK's Youth Voice perspective, or because I've got one at home. Um, I've got a bit, well, he, he's 15, he won't be 16 until August, but should have been doing his GCSEs this year. And Sue's really right, you know, that this... The class of 2020 are going to be like nothing any of us have ever seen before. You know, the difference in levels of internal confidence and ability to cope with, with what's happened to them alongside their family support and the social structures around them are also massively varying. Um, school approaches have been massively different too. So, you know, I can talk in that personal experience, but also young people are telling us, this cohort are telling us that they haven't had contact with school. There are not phone calls going home from every school. There are not careers advisor conversations happening with every pupil. I was on a call with a careers advisor network last week and they were telling me that they're struggling to get hold of pupils. So sometimes there is an absolute appetite and that outreach is trying to be done but actually accessing and contacting students remotely is also really tricky in this space. So, um, you know, I think we shouldn't underestimate the challenges that Sue's outlined. And I think, I think we all probably will underestimate those challenges. And until we see those young people coming through, you know, we just don't know what we're going to be dealing with. And um, young people are really worried about their mental health. They're really worried, they're anxious, the social isolation that this is causing them has, has really started to take its toll on lots of young people right now. So they're not feeling confident about making those choices. And without that support, that CAIG support around them, it's going to be really hard to re-engage them because those with you know, some barriers already to the education system, they're just going to be amplified during this time. So it, it sounds really doom and gloomy. There are some young people that will be able to fly regardless of what's happened to them but that's always the case I think what we'll see is that kind of social social divide the social mobility gaps just growing bigger and bigger because of this. Thank you Laura and, and somebody else that well I'd say that one of the things I've been doing obviously recently is talking to many college principals and it's been interesting hearing uh, their experience in terms of how engaged their learners are with the sort of remote learning activity that's currently taking place. Uh, what, what's, what, how engaged do you think young people are in terms of this remote learning side of things? You know, lots of people have been championing that type of learning for a long time in the sector and saying, you know, that is the future. Well, the future has been dubbed upon us rather rapidly. Uh, but there does seem, and I'll bring in John, uh, a college principal in a moment on this one, but there does seem a real um, difference between types of learner, whether that's academic level or, or, or just their own learning style. Yeah, I, I mean, it's what every it's what every teaching professional knows. Young people are different. You know, all learners are very different in their their styles, their their attitudes to learning. And, um, but I also think teachers have been very different in their attitudes to learning and to delivering an education, and their their confidence and ability to vary that up based on the cohorts that they're working with. So, so we are seeing such a difference both from the side of the young person but also from the offering coming from different schools and colleges um, and activities available. I, I think young people when it's done well are really engaging and enjoying the online learning. I think they take to it quite quickly because you know they, they tend to be sort of you know those that have access to digital technology because there's another issue in that but those that have got access to digital technology are enjoying you know being able to self-manage some of that learning and take responsibility for it. But again, there will be those young people that need you know, strict guidance and support who aren't also accessing it. So they'll be feeling quite lost within this home learning system too. Thank you. And, and John, David, I know you want to come in. I'll, I'll invite you in in just a second. I just want to bring in John 
uh, a college, the college principal from New College Durham uh, into the discussion. And what, what, how are you finding it with your, your younger learners, your 16, 17 year olds currently? It's gone better than anticipated, I think, uh, given that no one was ready for this, really. Uh, you know, we've all talked about online learning and digitization, but no one was ready for that rapid switch. So I think measuring participation, which we can, it's gone a lot better than, than anybody might have anticipated. I think the key issues for us are around some of the um, level one, level two foundation level students who literally want to get their hands dirty. And it's very difficult to do a lot of things online that they want to do. So for example, you know, we, we will be reopening on a very small scale for practical tests to, to establish competence among some young people so they can actually gain a qualification and then enter the labour market in things like construction, plumbing and so on. But it's difficult to see how you can do those online. I mean, a couple of other points to pick up what Laura Jane said. I mean, I think we're lucky in a sense, if we are lucky at all in this, that it's come at the end of the academic year when students have got to know their tutors, they've got to know each other, they've invested time in it. The thought of starting up with new cohorts of students in September who don't know each other, who come to college or indeed stay in school sixth form, go to work for the social. I think that's going to be a real challenge. But to pick up that keep in touch point as well, yeah, it, it's really difficult to keep in touch. We, we try to run projects around NEAT in the Northeast and nobody tracks them. There is no career service anymore that's keeping tabs on kids once they leave school. So nobody knows where they are and they're off the DWP radar as well. So there's just a black hole there into which some of these kids could easily slip. What can you do about it? I mean, we've gone online with advice and guidance sessions. So we had 170 kids and their families participate on the first one. That doubled on the second one. We're running, our, we do an induction evening for parents and kids coming in September. That's going to be in the form of a podcast, but it will be, it will be streamed out to people. Um, and there'll be a virtual tour of the college, which is really quite easy to do now with the technology. And we've actually sent out relevant. So those who couldn't be bothered to do their, you know, the theoretical GCSE prep because they were, you know, they'd probably prefer to get an assessed grade anyway in some cases. Um, but what we've sent out is material relevant to the vocational area. So we've sent that to every kid who's applied. So I think that, that's that's really good. I mean, it's, oh, this is the recording could go out. It's not the highest quality because it's had to be put together as quickly as possible. But we do have time to do things like that between now and the start of the academic year, if we can resource it. So what do you think uh, September will look like at your college in terms of delivery? Messy. Um, you know, we're going to have to bring students in, um, perhaps for a different college day. We've talked about the implication on transport, a semi-rural area. We know they're going to only half capacity on each bus that comes in because of social distancing. Uh, we know they're going to prioritise people coming to work. So we're thinking about maybe a differently timed college day. We're thinking maybe, you know, 10 to 3.30 or something like that. Uh, so they don't put pressure on, on that public service. <laughs> we're also thinking about potentially having, um, instead of trying to plan a curriculum on a linear basis, September through to June, July, to modularise it. So we'll, we'll do complete units of learning, which is something we've not really done before. But that then gives them something in the bank. Um, so I think that also is, is a different approach that's probably a good idea anyway, but it's been precipitated by the situation that we're in. The big thing to me, though, is how you get that social experience across. So we are going to have to give some thought to that, because certainly for the younger students, uh, you know, 16, 17-year-olds on level one, two, even level three, actually, but level one, two particularly, they need that socialisation. It's part of what makes them employable. And that's what we really need to think very carefully about. Because, I mean, they'll be doing it anyway, but we need to find some way to, to formalise it. Everybody, you, you've only got to walk around the town here and you'll see groups of, of, of you know, teenage kids are getting together. Um, and they're sort of distance, but not, well, one or two I saw the other night weren't distance, but that's another story. Um, you know, they're, they're kids, they're going to do that sort of thing. Absolutely. Uh, David, um, uh, from Education Policy Institute, I, you've indicated that you'd like to contribute? Hi, thanks, Shane. Uh, I, to, to build on the points from Laura and John, really, um, around the challenge of transitions for those entering post-16 education. We know that um, teacher assessment, uh, which of course is the primary source for the grades being handed out uh, at age 16, tends to be biased towards, against disadvantaged learners. 
Um, now, the Ofqual proposal, to a degree, takes account of some of the sort of between school variation and disadvantage, but not within school. So essentially, we will end up in a place where it's highly likely that disadvantaged learners will be biased against to some degree in the grades they achieve in their GCSEs. So I think for, for post-16 institutions, this is going to present additional challenges in matching them to a programme of study. Um, and there may be more adjustments needed on in that early, in those early stages. So I don't have all the solutions to that and be interested to hear from John and others what could be done, but I do think um, that, that there's definitely an additional challenge here. So very quickly going to John then. John, what, what, what would your solutions be? Um, I should charge for that, shouldn't I, really? Um, I mean, I don't think there's a solution for, that fit all. Uh, again, Laura Jenkins said, all students come with different needs and priorities. Some adapt to the college environment anyway better than others. Um, so I just think we need to, that's my phone going in the background there, always happens on these conferences. I, I think we need to talk, talk to the students, actually, and ask them about their expectation and, and make sure that we can at least meet some of it whenever we can. I think that's probably, probably a DfE special advisor picking up the phone to hear what your solutions are. <laughs> okay, um, Becky, uh, just whilst John is uh, answering his phone, Becky Newson, uh, you've, you've messaged through uh, a comment around transition support at each age point into education outward for those thinking about the labour market. Could you expand on that for us a little? Yeah, it just feels ever more crucial. So we've got a group of um, kids sort of at that leaving point of education, the pre-16 education, and they're going to end up with a set of marks that aren't what everybody else has. They're not really sure what these are worth. I totally get what David was saying about um, how they could be disadvantaged. They need support about how to articulate what those means, what, what those grades mean, and to value that as they move into FE. They need support to continue to make the positive choice of education. We know that most 16 year olds do continue in full time education and it's in their best interest that they do so at this time because the labour market is going to be really tough for the very young people and the opportunities are going to be very constrained. Um, they're already constrained for apprenticeships at that age. So it feels like they need the schools to be getting back in touch, having one to one sessions and making sure they do reach um, those who are most disadvantaged and actually kind of track them and sort of help them make transitions to whether it's a sixth form, whether it's a sixth form college or FE, wherever it's going to be, they need to be supported into that college and to understand what they're facing in that college, what education is going to look like. Um, I've made another point about the need for mental health support. It's an under-researched area for FE. We know there is support there, but we also know we need to articulate far more um, what can happen in the sector because mental health needs in this age group tend to be um, increasing um, and, and becoming higher. They will be in this COVID environment. So institutions and the staff within them across the board need to be sort of highly aware and looking for the signals that young people need additional support. I kind of feel like the personal tutor system in the FE is going to become increasingly important and they're going to need that one-to-one -one kind of marking sort of from school into FE. Um, similarly those heading to the labour market are going to need to be able to articulate what their qualifications are worth to employers. They may not look the same, um, you know, they won't have certificates as other kids will, you know, they're going to need support about how to articulate that. So I think some kind of transition worker doing some very depth work is going to be quite important, particularly to those who are most likely to become neat at the age of 16 to 17. Thank you. And, and Stephen from Learning and Work Institute, I, you've got sort of, your job is to, to look at, at these sort of neat figures in detail. Um, what, what are the latest stats showing? Thanks, Shane. I mean, we know that most 16 and 17 year olds are in full time education, as people have uh, said. But of those that aren't, uh, we don't we don't even know where 50 percent of them are. Um, so of those 16 and 17 year olds who are neat, uh, the, the status um, of half of them is recorded as unknown. Um, and as I think John said, they're not eligible for um, universal credit. So 
they're, they're less likely to get support from Job Centre Plus. And then we know that various neat tracking services and neat prevention services have been uh, rolled back and faced funding cuts over the last um, decade or so. So I think for me, you know, it's kind of recognising we weren't in the world's best position coming into this crisis with attainment at level three, for example, and and uh, participation rates for this age group and, and, and others. And then we've got the added challenge of this. And I think it will take several, uh, the evidence of all previous recessions is it takes several years for employment to recover back to pre-recession uh, levels. This one might be different because the causes are different, but feels unlikely to me. So this is probably a sort of two or three year um, challenge. And I guess just to add to, so somebody asked for some solutions. So I, I just add, chop a, a couple in, which may or may not be, the right ones but just food for thought. Um, we had really low numbers of young people in this age group taking up apprenticeships to start with and that's now gone off a cliff. So what can we do to better um, target apprenticeships at young people including 16 and uh, 17 year olds? Um, I think we also need a better, whether it's a careers advice service or whether it's colleges and providers or whoever it happens to be, somebody needs to be talking to these 16 and 17 year olds in a, a socially distanced appropriate way um, to, to make sure that we don't lose them and that we don't end up with a big spike in uh, 16 and 17 year old needs by the autumn, which feels to me like a really big risk. And we know that in general in recessions, young people tend to stay in education more and that's probably a pretty sensible thing, as others have said. Um, but it's the ones who are most likely to miss out and, and not take it up themselves unless we go and talk to them and go and engage them and go and support them that I'd be most worried about. So it's that residualization and that um, accumulating disadvantage that I think we just need to be really hard and tough in intervening to prevent now. Thank you, Stephen. And Lee Breyer from the CICB, you make an, an, an interesting point, obviously, around that young people now more than ever will need some assistance in uh, uh, help uh, understanding uh, what the labour market is looking like in terms of opportunity. Lee, could you provide a few more comments on that? You yeah, know, I just think it's sort of concern around, obviously, the what the sort of jobs of the future look like and in terms of of what um you know the recovery plan looks like i was just talking about linking it to kind of green green recovery green skills um the digitization of of, of industry and jobs as well and it's sort of you know, i think young people need a view you know, what is the future of jobs to inform their kind of choices now and and over the, probably as mark said over the next sort of 12 to sort of 16 months as well i think the concern is that see, they might just go with um, you know, perhaps what's available rather than what is right and I think that that would be a concern from you know, employers and industry. Super, thank you. Does anyone else want to come in on the 16, 17 year old section just before we move on to 18 to 25? I think Becky I've seen you physically raise your hand uh, so Becky will be the the last caller so to speak uh, during this section before we move on to 18 to 24 year olds. Becky. I just want to think about those sort of 17s who are actually thinking about leaving FE at the moment and those who have done vocational qualifications in sectors which have, you know, absolutely fallen through the floor in terms of vacancy. So, the tip, you know, those young person entry routes, hospitality, for example, customer service areas, they're definitely going to need some additional career support. They may need support to help them think about how they transfer into different sectors in the labour market where the recovery is um, moving more rapidly. Um, so I just don't want to lose sight of those who've had vocational specialisms that may not now work as we move into changed labour market. Thank you. I think we could have probably had a, an entire round table looking at the impact on 16, 17 year olds, but sadly we've only got 15 minutes on this occasion. Um, now we're going to move on to the 18 to 24 year old section. For those that have just joined us uh, in our virtual roundtable room, uh, just so you know, if you'd like to make a contribution during today's session, please use the Zoom group chat function uh, just to make a brief comment around your general point or just say, I want to contribute and I will invite you in when appropriate. Okay, uh, to introduce the 18 to 24 year old section, uh, I'd introduce Mark and Sue once again. Mark and Sue. Should I start? Um, yes, okay. So, um, thank you, Shay. Uh, on 18 to 24 year olds, it's a bigger cohort, of course. Um, I think this is a DFE as well as a DWP agenda. I'm waiting for DFE to, to say what they've got to offer in this space. It's not just DWP. 
This is an HE agenda, a full-time higher education agenda, as well as an active labour market policy. We really do need uh, higher education. I'm so pleased that Nick is, is with us uh, today because that's an important part. I mean, 32% of 18 to 24 year olds are in full-time education. Most of those are in higher education. Uh, and indeed, we're now seeing a tick up of those that are studying postgraduates. Now, I think Shane, Professor Ewart Keep, that many of us will, will know, uh, had an article for Ethi Week who said his great worry was that graduates and post, uh, graduates this year, uh, who did, uh, and also those that don't decide not to go into higher education, could cascade down the labour market, taking non graduate jobs from non graduates. He was very worried about that. Add on to the fact that we have about uh, two and a half million 18 to 24 year olds in employment but outside of full time education. And the Resolution Foundation have said in, that's a key category, but it's those at the lower skilled end that are losing their jobs already. So um, I think it's really important that we have a very broad range of options. I don't want to see any caps on participation in full time undergraduate HE, including vocational sub degrees. Take the maintenance loan. I hope that the experience will justify that. I would like to see more students, graduates, go for the postgraduate one year talk course. £11,200, I understand. And if HEIs price them at 8000 there's 3200 left. We know that the marginal propensity to save of students is zero for you economists out there. So therefore it would be used for maintenance. It means that postgraduates have some money to live off. Um, in terms of uh, apprenticeships, the paper does say we need free training for non-levy payers on apprenticeships. We also need to look at wage subsidies for 19 to 24 year olds, probably higher than, but equivalent to 16 to 18 year olds. But I do worry about the word guarantee. We must not over promise our young people with a guarantee of an apprenticeship, not with the way that the structure of the economy could be in October, September. Um, active labour market policies, well, Stephen is an expert on all of this. Six months, don't wait for 12 months. There'll be some that will be unemployed for six months this September. So there is no time to lose, to coin uh, uh, Susan's uh, phrase. But I don't think active labour market policies on their own are the answer. And I'm a lone voice on this. I th and I don't understand why. I think there is a massive contribution that FE colleges can make about expanding full time places for 19 to 24 year olds. First of all, level two, first of all, level three is free. There's no fees. But that age group has no access to a national entitlement to maintenance support. And so therefore, if we want to encourage young people to shield themselves and do world class uh, uh, level three qualifications, let's give them some maintenance support so they can do so. I'm pretty tough. I think the JSA rate for 18 to 24 year olds is 58 pounds 90p a week, times it by 52 weeks. It's about 3,000 and a bit. Well, you've got a choice. You either go down the active labor market policy route and look for a job or get a subsidized job. Or if you want to do full-time education at a college, you have an entitlement, not to some lucky dip bursary that may or may not be available, but a solid amount of money to expand full-time education. And the last point, Shane, is what would be far easier to deliver, and I've changed my mind slightly, is a 16 to 24 T-level guarantee. Why? First of all, level three is free. The delivery is dependent on providers, not an employer. If we are giving wage subsidies for job creation schemes and apprenticeships, subsidies to employers for a work placement would be just as good. And from an employer's perspective, less onerous perhaps that in the short term than taking on an apprentice because they'd be employed but then you would need to have maintenance and I would go for maintenance loans because 
not that I would want maintenance loans, it's just because it's the only way you could probably get the hard hearts of the treasury even to discuss the idea. So a broad brush, H-E, F-E, there you go. Lots, lots, lots of items there for us to chew over. Um, interested on, on the guarantee argument, obviously we've got the Education Select Committee Chairman Robert Halford currently lobbying uh, Treasury and the Department for Education uh, around an apprenticeship guarantee. Not really certain myself what that means in detail, but I understand he's writing for FE Week later this week with a bit more detail on that one. And of course, you mentioned that we should have, potentially, I think if I understood correctly, a T-level guarantee, at which point I know David Robinson uh, from EPI has some comments on that. David? Yeah, hi. Um, Mark, I was uh, just on your T-levels point. I mean, the rollout of T-levels is relatively slow over the next few years, and the sector already had capacity worries about delivering on those timescales. I wonder whether now is the time to rely on, on T-levels rather than looking at provision across the board. I mean, I'm all in favour of greater maintenance support, for example, as a way of encouraging participation. But I wonder whether t setting T levels out as part of the answer here may be neither the answer and, and, and actually may, uh, may risk the rollout of T levels more broadly. Did I answer that? Well, well, my answer really is that um, maintenance drives participation. And so therefore we could have maintenance for full time FE 19 to 24 uh, four year olds, first full level three grants, but if not loans, I will then allow the educationists, should we use the current suite of um, level three qualifications, uh, I, I would say if they're in STEM subjects, uh, yes. But the counter argument would be, we've got a crisis, David, in September. If we can turn the NHS round to sort out COVID-19, and they've done a brilliant job, the education system, if it wants to do T-levels, should be able to do T-levels by September. I think, so we I, think, I think we've really got to just bear in mind, this is not just a, a minor hiccup we're going to face. And we've got six weeks before July and, and, and the, the budget report to come up with something a bit radical. So we need a bit more can do rather than not do it. That, that's all. I mean, but I'd be happy with if more young people want to do full time FE with their maintenance support. I'd go with any level three that the education system would go for. But maybe T level should be in the mix. Perhaps we should ramp them up. That would be my suggestion for you to debate in this wonderful forum. A key element of the T-level, obviously, is, is the work placement. Brenda, you, you've mentioned from Learning Curve Group that you have recently or just come from an employer meeting and there was huge concerns around whether or not they would have capacity to, to provide work placements uh, in the short term. Can you explain? Yeah, Shane, yeah, Shane thanks for that. Um, two of the, large, the, the big concerns from the large employer forum I've just been to with ALP um, is one around work placements one because of the restrictions due to COVID-19 in the short term but secondly due to the staff reductions in the longer term that those organizations are going to have to make and then the second concern they had was about their ability to recruit new apprentices and, and uh, we've seen the number of young apprentices drop already their ability to recruit new apprentices, particularly when they're making redundancies and, and there's uh, indications there's going to be large scale redundancies. So how could they possibly be making redundancies with one hand and then taking on people on short term on apprenticeship programs um, with the other hand? Now, that's why I think the, the point Lauren, I think Sue both made earlier on is that what we need is definitely a skills training program, a skills uh, training uh, a funding guarantee for these people uh, and particularly given um, a, a number of people have made the point it's particularly the lower level students who it's hard to engage and it's the lower level skills individuals who are being made redundant so what are we going to do to engage them when when perhaps they were already significantly disengaged going into their for the young people going into their bedroom and dragging them out where they've been sat playing on Fortnite since uh, March and, and getting them re-engaged is going to be a feat in itself. 
But, but while, whilst there's a reduction in the jobs market, we should absolutely be reskilling these individuals into those sector areas where we see the economic upturn coming first. Thank you. And, and, and John, from a college principal's perspective, I understand just focusing on T levels again, following the early contributions. Uh, my understanding is correct that New College Durham are providing T level from September. Uh, what, what are the, the sort of murmurings you're having with your employer partners at the moment around the, the work placement element? Well, the work placement's always been the most challenging part anyway. And I think, you know, um, said it's right, employers have got other things to do at the moment. And if they're managing a downscale of their business and trying to survive, it's really asking a lot. We ask a lot of employers anyway. We're asking the impossible really. So, and can you create these vacancies that we can then fill with apprentices? Um, and my experience of this over too many years probably is when the jobs start to come back in again, they'll start to take more mature people who are already skilled or can easily acquire the new skills rather than young, lower ability people. And I think that's the big challenge is to, is to give them because once we've lost them, we've lost them. You know, if they don't get engaged pretty soon into the autumn, then they'll just disappear. And I think that's going to be a major, major challenge for us there. Um, I think the other issue just, on, and Brent said, is around capacity. Because if we've got things like social distancing for the foreseeable future, then you know, one of the questions we were asked was, have you got the capacity to take increased numbers? And as a principal, you always say, yes, of course. But actually, if we're running our facilities at you know, twice the capacity, we're, we're having to put smaller classes into large workshops, laboratories, that's a big factor. We'll also need more teachers to do that as well, because you know, colleges don't have a lot of fat on the bone at the moment. So recruiting the teachers to deal with these increased cohorts is going to be quite a challenge. Maybe we can join the circle, really, and, and some of the people who've been made redundant or furloughed or whatever, lost their jobs in all this, we can re-engage them as teachers or instructors within the system. But again, it's, it's Sue's chapter heading. Time's running out to do that. You can't just drop them in to a very difficult situation in September which will be challenging enough for experienced professionals. It's got to start now. Thank you. I'm going to bring in uh, Simon Ashworth, and I know that Stephen Evans has got a contribution, and Marja as well wants to make a contribution. I'm really conscious that within this section, I want to bring in Nick Hillman from HEPI uh, to look at the higher, educa uh, higher education view on this one, because I think that's a really fascinating one, particularly picking up on the sort of social interaction element that some of you have mentioned already. Uh, Simon, you've, you've brought in the sort of traineeship programme, i.e. the pre-apprenticeship programme uh, for young people. Do you want to expand on your points there? Yeah, so I just think that, that one of the areas not talked about, massive missed opportunity, is traineeships, uh, an established programme that's been around for a period of time. It's, uh, it's lost a bit of momentum, um, but actually, you know, it's an established programme and it could be a, um, a useful vehicle for, for young people. Uh, if, if it had some enhancements to it, you know, some flexibility around eligibility, uh, duration, um, getting providers access to, to funding, growth funding, rather than sort of lagged funding, uh, I just think it's um, certainly for this sort of cohort, you know, maybe some flexibilities around simulated work work placements. But you know, you know, training T levels we were talking about before, it's it's a massively untried and untested program. I just think um, as kind of Sue was talking about earlier, we shouldn't be looking necessarily at um, reinventing the wheel. We should maybe look at sweating our own assets, what we've got at the moment, and. Um, you know what what works and how we can um, how we can have some flexibilities to to scale them up. Thank you. And uh, Stephen Evans, you've got your hand raised. Someone has learned how to raise the hand. <laughs> this is on the job learning, Shane. Uh, yeah. So I, I mean, I, I've got a, a vast array of doom laden charts and stats, uh, which I won't bore you with. But I, I think that the fact that we may well hit a million. 18 to 24 year old needs over the next year, one in five. That's what happened in the last uh, recession. Um, it should be quite sobering uh, for us and shows the scale um, of the challenge. So the question is, what do you do about it? And then we then get into a sort of vast array of um, programs and, and, and acronyms and should we invent a new one or use the existing ones? And historically, even at the best of times, it's been quite difficult to join up DFE and DGBP um, support. So I think um, we published jointly with IES and seven other organisations a report called, called Help Wanted a couple of weeks ago, which tried to draw together our collective experience and thoughts on some of these things. And I think I'd start from the fact that every 18 to 24 year old ought to have an offer of a education, employment or training place. 
and start from that and then work out the funding and the policy uh, from, from there on in. And that would include, for me, incentives around um, apprenticeships for that um, age group. Um, it would include good quality employment support and potentially new employment programmes. It would include more people staying in further education um, as well. And I think, for me, it would have to be backed up by a jobs guarantee as well for those who fail to find work after a certain period of time, a bit like the future jobs fund that we had um, back after the, the last recession, which the independent evaluation showed had a positive impact on young people's long term pay and job prospects and um, paid back its money to the exchequer uh, through that. And there's been other examples of those sorts of things. Um, so for me, we could do some really socially valuable things and, and we, we're going to invest in low carbon technology. Well, let's create some jobs through that and ring fence them for young people where it's appropriate. Uh, if we're going to invest in social need, let's do that and let's make sure that young people get linked into those jobs. I think there's just a great chance to put together a vision for the future of our economy with the employment that that's going to create and then the skills that young people need to get into them and um, that's kind of probably easier said than done um, but I think we have so many of the building blocks there and if we started from that guarantee for a young person and then worked back to say well what what do we need to put together to make that happen that feels to me a better way to approach it than to say well we've got all these programs and what do we do with them or shall we create a new one start with what we're trying to achieve which is education employment or training for young people and work back from that thank you Stephen and uh, John I think you've got your your hand raised did you want to make a point on here yeah just a, a plea really from funders and government for more flexibility because the one thing I think we're certain about is this isn't going to fit academic years so you know if a, a young person has a job offer they're going to be really tempted to take it we've got to find some way of making those barriers between full-time part-time apprenticeship as penetratable as possible uh, otherwise you know, we'll have kids dropping out because they take the full-time route from a college perspective you want them to continue and to succeed because that's the way you get paid for them being cynical about it but you do you want to get the qualification we're trying to make a, a you know, these silos we've got to address once and for all this transition from full-time to work to, to apprenticeship so that providers are not disincentivized from, from offering the best for the young person concerned. Thank you. I want to bring in Marja now from the uh, Resolution Foundation. Marja, I think you want to make an, an interesting point around uh, employment uh, within the retail and hospitality sectors in particular of non-grads. And of course, whilst, whilst people are, are learning in FE and HE environments, uh, they will often be employed within these industries on a part-time basis to help you know provide them some income to afford to learn essentially for their for their sort of general expenditure Marjorie, would you like to come in here on this point yeah thanks so uh, we've done a couple of papers at the resolution foundation looking specifically at young people in the crisis and basically what's really unique so in all crises young people tend to be the most hit right but what's really unique about this crisis is that there are particular sectors that are hugely hit by the lockdown measures and these are like hospitality retail these are exactly the sort of sectors that both employ young people in general but also tend to be the sectors that young people go into immediately immediately after a crisis so when we think about all these measures and all the training programs and whether there should be a job guarantee or not i think it's really important to not lose sight of the long-term implications to that true economy and what kind of economy grads and non-grads education leavers in general will be going into after this crisis kind of reduces its grip a bit and we're trying to go back to normal uh, what we've seen at the resolution foundation research is that we're going to see really long-term pay scarring and employment scarring effects um, and i think one way to reduce those effects is to actually make sure that young people have an option of going into other sectors and so not go into the standard uh, education leaver sectors but help young people go into alternative sectors that will actually be open taking on grads um, and helping helping people actually move on to the jobs that exist thank you and i think now is probably an appropriate time to bring in uh, nick kilman from the higher education policy institute uh, nick what's the what's happening in the world of higher education yeah well um thanks very much i was so pleased to be invited to do this not least because sue and i used to work together in biz and um and because mark i've learned so much from mark over the years about the importance of maintenance and i agree with everything he said on that because i think it is you know an obvious difference between different opportunities the you know availability of thousands of pounds of maintenance for your full-time he offer and 
bugger all if I'm allowed to swear for 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 many others. Um, so uh, so I thought so I've learned a lot from that. And thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, I mean, on HE, I've been going around for years telling. Uh, young people, their advisors, their parents, their teachers that, you know, this year is going to be a fantastic year to emerge from school because or college because you're part of the smallest cohort for a very long time and therefore they'll have the pick of HE courses. Uh, and of course, it turned out to be a terrible lie because they're actually a very unlucky cohort with um, not quite made up A-level grades, but A-level grades that some people won't see as completely trustworthy as Sue said at the beginning and of course we've had only today uh, an announcement well actually last night from the Department for Education uh, about student number caps this year uh, okay it's quite a liberal cap but you know the, the thing I'm proudest to have worked on in my time in Whitehall was removing student number caps there was no artificial limit on how many people could go into higher education to reimpose number caps in the depth of a crisis is quite a dangerous thing to do because the Treasury may be much more reluctant to um, remove number caps again in future when they're looking to save costs. And we know, don't we, the Prime Minister said the other day he's finding it easier to take uh, freedoms away from people than to give them back to people at the moment. And I worry that might also apply to student uh, number caps. But, but nonetheless, um, there's also, I think, only been one mention, maybe more, of postgraduate study. And of course, someone who went straight to university and is is graduating this summer uh, will still be well within your uh, 18 to 24 age category. They might only be 21, 22. They've had a very disrupted year of education with strikes before the pandemic. And uh, I think there's a very strong case for some people to stay on, but again, for the reasons Mark said, um, to do postgraduate education. And we published a very uh, detailed report, in fact, our most detailed report ever, the other day on postgraduate education since the last recession. And we saw during the last recession a big uptake in postgraduate courses, particularly taught master's courses. And, you know, back then there was no master's loan. And now there's a master's loan. Uh, and the master's loan, when it was first introduced in 2016, saw a 59% increase among um, the, the bottom polar group in that terms of access to postgraduate education. So I think we will see, and in fact, we're also seeing universities under the radar writing to their final year students saying, we'll give you a discount or stay on and do an extra year with us. Don't enter the labor market this year. Um, of course, in, in a way, so all, you know, in a way, people staying on to do more full time. You've got to really, really, really like your parents, by the way, to defer your HE place this year. I think deferrals will be a little bit lower than people think. Because, you know, if you've just been locked down with your parents for months on end, you can't go traveling in Asia and you can't get a job very easily. I, I don't think there will be that many deferrals this year. Um, but some of those issues, more people staying on for postgraduate education, a higher proportion going on for full-time HE might, as other people have said, make the scarring problem worse because it means some people are better qualified to take jobs uh, and the people who are, are, are lesser skilled may have a worse scarring effect. And we know, not least in the Resolution Foundation's work, uh, that and the Nuffield Foundation work, that um, scarring has a long-term effect, goes on for decades if, if you have that on your CV. So, so the final thing I'd say is is there may be things the universities, the suppliers of training can do that complement some of the things that other education providers can do. So there's no reason why universities, if the funding uh, was right, and they've been doing this in Australia, by the way, couldn't put on short term courses, for example, to raise people's skills and to bridge uh, you know, to bridge the difficulty, e difficult economic times we're currently going into. And I would like the DfE, when it's looking at all the other ideas that have been suggested by Mark, by Sue, by John, by some of the other people, to actually think about the capacity of universities who might otherwise be laying off staff to also put on short term courses and to look at people's entitlement to financial support for doing those short term courses during the crisis. Thank you. Does anyone want to pick up on any of the points that Nick has just made around HE at all? I think it was interesting at, at the point you make around deferring for, for your eyes with my uh, friend's uh, child who's uh, completing their A-levels this summer and uh, the weekend and they just looked absolutely gobsmacked at the thought that they might have to stay at home for the next 12 months with mum and dad. Yeah, all the young people I meet, they're in a hurry to get on with their lives. 
Yeah, and like you say, they can't on their ordinary gap year, they can't, you know, do a year it's sort of industry placement, internship or whatever, because those opportunities will be few and far between uh, academic year. So, I, you know, I think you're right, a lot will want to go to university, but it'll be a very different HE experience to the traditional. Yes, and it, it, well, it may be in the short term, hopefully by January, they, you know, things may be more normal. I mean, just one other, two other very quick thoughts. Of course, none of what I said goes for the international students and the, the big financial drop off there is, the number one concern of universities. You also asked about socialization. I mean, our polling work that we did a year or two ago of both applicants and students suggest that people see that as really important. You know, when we said to people, what's your favorite way of learning at university? They said lectures. We didn't expect that because lectures are a very inefficient way of learning in terms of how much goes into your brain. As some academic research suggests, your brain works less hard in a boring lecture than when you're asleep. Um, and, you know, lectures are not very efficient, but they, uh, students like them because they're social occasions. And when we said to students, if lectures were banned, what would you want to replace them? And they didn't say more ed tech, they said more face-to-face -face learning, different sorts of face-to-face -face learning. Interesting. Uh, John, um, do you want to quickly come in on... on I'm tempted to say whether Zoom conferences and the new lectures, but uh, it's the it's the last point that that Nick made really around, and I think it probably echoes what I said about flexibility. We're, we're hampered in that small unit delivery by the 25% intensity rule in HE. So you've got to be 25% of a full time program. That that's I think got all sorts of implications for widening participation students, for mature students who've been seen a big drop off because they can be tempted to dip their toe in the water, to, to, to just try something out, and then you can build on that and take it forward. And I think we've lost that capacity for running the HE system entirely. And the same thing around equivalent level qualifications. We're gonna have lots of graduates out there, you know, and, and I'm always gonna show that I say this, but with, with the wrong degrees for the current climate. And I, I, I take all the things about intellectual preparation, character that we will take those as red, but basically to find some way of taking someone with a degree relevant to an area where the jobs aren't going to be, to in some way allow them to convert across into an area where we think the jobs are going to be. And so that form of conversion course and that sort of ELQ, because it might be at level four or five, not at level six or seven. So we talked about post-grad, but it could well be at that senior technical level. You know, things like production management, where we know from, from big manufacturers in this region, level five is, is really what they want. Super, thank you. And I can see Nick virtually agreeing with you uh, here, here in the, in the group chat. Um, I'm afraid we are uh, rapidly uh, running out of time. Uh, so we will be moving on now to the next section, which is adults. And I'd now like to invite the report authors, Sue and Mark, uh, to introduce this section. So... Adults, as you know, is my favourite subject at the moment, yeah, and adults fall into different categories and we just talked about the adult, the 18 plus, who was the graduate and as normal, you know, if you do well in your A-levels, you'll find a degree, it might not be um, the degree of the future, but my position is we need people in something in September, so I don't want um, us to use COVID-19 as an excuse to start trying to do skills matching, to start saying this is the job of the future, so we'll just have degrees in that. This is the job of the future, so we'll just run a level three in that, because we don't know. What's really important for this September is that we've got people doing something. So whether that's graduates doing a postgraduate or people with A-levels doing degrees or people who just missed their A-levels doing um, the foundation year or year zero, that people are doing something. And if it just happens to be the wrong something, well, I'm more, I'm happy about that. Because if we listened to politicians 20 years ago, you know, we wouldn't have that digital gaming business that we've got in the East End of London and Liverpool now. You know, if we listened to politicians, we wouldn't have had, you know, the wonderful arts that we've had for the last 10 years. So we're not good in this country of skills matching. And the other bit that worries me about adults is the bottom end, right? The ones that we, you know, we least talk about. You know, if you look at how many words are written about HE compared to how many words are written about the person who haven't got a level one qualification, they know we're on the, you know, they know we're near the same, no one near the same. And those people with low skills, um, they are probably in the hands of DWP. And that's what worries me. 
And I'd rather it be in the hands of DFE, where DFE can just say, we have a programme for them, we're going to fund them, please DWP, let them keep the universal credit, or let's have a maintenance award for them, but let's do the most sensible thing for September, and let's not bring in um, sanctions. I've heard that word so many times in the last 10 days from DWP, I want to scream, because people need carrots, not sticks. We've just come through a pandemic and they need to feel good about life, not bad about life. And that's it, Shane. Thank you, Sue. Uh, Stephen, from Learning and Work Institute. Were, were you, sorry, were you, were you applauding, Sue, or were you signaling, signaling to speak? I couldn't quite uh, work. Probably applaud. Applauding, <laughs> say applaud. Yeah, I, I always applaud Sue. She she makes 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 certain of it. No, I I was applauding Sue. I'd also worked out how to do it, and I did want to say something very quickly if I could as well. So it was all three. <laughs> um, so um uh, so yeah, agree with what Sue said. I, I guess I, what I wouldn't forget about that as well, as well as those who are out of work, where I think we need a joined up employment and skills solution. We've got eight point seven million. 8.7 million workers who are furloughed under the coronavirus job retention scheme. If even just 10% of those don't go back to their previous jobs, could be more, could be less, but you know, we're heading up towards a million people there uh, and they're literally being paid not to work currently. Probably about 20, at least 20% of them are going to have uh, relatively low basic skills like literacy and numeracy. This would be quite a handy time to do something about that, wouldn't it? as well as thinking about how do we help them find um, other jobs, which I think is partly about responding to potential redundancy and is partly about um, retraining without getting over predictive in the way that Sue quite rightly said. So I agree about the, you know, we've, unemployment has risen from probably about 1.2 million to more like two and a half million currently. So it's doubled in like a couple of months. So we need a solution for them, but also those 8.7 million furloughed workers. We, you know, we're 10 weeks into lockdown now. Uh, we really need a much bigger scale of ambition and action and urgent action to get proper help and support uh, to that group now as well. Stephen, has there, uh, have there, has there been any forecasting or modelling around the, the sort of predicted proportion on furlough that are likely to be made redundant? I haven't seen anything recently. No, I think the, the problem is, it, 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 the, the unfortunate economist answer is it depends um, because we don't quite know how the lockdown will continue to be eased. So I think about 5 million workers are working in lockdown sectors, according to our estimates. So that's starting to be eased. Even when they reopen, social distancing will reduce their capacity uh, for, for customers. So that will reduce demand. And people may be nervous to go back or not have the incomes to go back. Uh, but then there are other growth areas, like there's growth in health and social care. Um, we probably need fewer people working in supermarkets it's some more people delivery drivers and standing outside supermarkets to stop you going in so there's, there's there are growth areas in vacancies as well so i don't think we quite know how many of those furloughed staff will lose their jobs which makes policy uh, quite tricky but we do know there'll be some of them and we know there's growth areas as well our challenge is to not um sort of overly predict and manage these things, but to give people and employers the tools to bring themselves together, which I think is a bit of what Sue was getting at there as well, and hence the applause. Thank you. Uh, Marja from Resolution Foundation. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that and just say that it's absolutely true that uh, a lot of low-skilled people are, or lower-skilled people are being furloughed to a greater extent, but we're also seeing that uh, from a survey that we commissioned um, during the middle of the crisis, so this is kind of during crisis numbers, that it's, it's also disproportionately young people, so 18, 24 again, but also kind of people in the later 20s, and um, in addition to people over 60, so workers uh, in their group 60 to 64 are also particularly more likely to be followed, more likely to have lost a job, and more likely to have lost pay during the crisis. So when we think about all these things. Is it, um, it's kind of an open question because we were a bit surprised about that at the Resolution Foundation. So what can we do about this group of older workers? Because um, so, the risk is that they just end up taking early retirement, which is, might not be what they want um, or need. So getting them back into the labour market, what, what do people think about that? Thank you. And from a training provider's perspective, Brenda uh, at Learning Curve Group, I know has been running a campaign over uh, the, the, the lockdown period. And We've worked with lots of adult learners. What's, what's the feeling uh, your side, Brenda? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the comment there from Stephen with regards to furloughed workers, absolutely relevant. We, we started a campaign when lockdown started called Educate Whilst You Isolate, which, which had a huge response. We had 28,000 expressions of interest within the first six weeks. Now, interestingly, back to Becky's point, a third of those were, were for mental health related qualifications. Um, and also lots of response from people who all of a sudden had become teachers and were having to homeschool their children and they had lower level of skills and needed some support. Unfortunately, and, and this is why I agree with the urgent call for action, there isn't a funding pot there to sustain it. Obviously, colleges have been given 100% funding guarantee. Um, there is, hasn't been any increase in the adult education budget, so there's an issue. But even when we start to get back to normal, there's a fear factor out there with adults about one, going back to work, two, participating in groups, traveling on public transport. So we really do have to think outside the box about a blended model for, for at least you know, the, the foreseeable future that will continue to reach out to these vulnerable adults, particularly who are low skilled and neat, which is my, uh, is my uh, Achilles heel, I'm afraid. Um, I agree that we should make sure that every adult who wants these uh, skills should be given them. Um, as much about reeling them and getting the economy moving again and getting them back into work as their mental health and the societal benefits of making sure that they're engaging in learning and education. Thank you. Um, David Robinson from EPI, you've got a question? Yeah, hi. Um, we've talked about this is quite an overarching question. I hope you don't mind coming in, me coming in with this. Um, we've talked about quite a lot of different initiatives and policies, uh, much greater levels of participation, additional maintenance support, uh, support for transitions around careers. Um, I, I wonder whether we are all working on the basis that actually cost benefit wise, these things would all pay off in the long term or whether there's any need for triaging the asks that uh, we as a sector are making to identify those that we think will make the biggest impact. Um, because I don't think education and training is probably the only part of uh, the only part of the economy that will be making asks at the moment. Um, and there's a lot of asks. And I think a lot, I agree with 99% of what people are uh, asking for. But um, I'm not sure how much will be delivered. So I'd be interested on thoughts on that. That little question in the last few minutes. Uh, so just a brief sort of summary of that, I guess, is, is to say, uh, should we not waste our time asking for so much uh, and, and be realistic, given... I think it's a quite Yeah, that's the question. Yeah. Sue? I mean, I mean, the answer to me is simple, David, is that the money's in actually in the system. So if these people are not in training, they're pulling down universal credit anyway. And, uh, you know, what, what's the old side, you know, idle hands and all that? We, if we don't think of it in any other way, but just think about keeping people occupied or there'll be disturbances on the street next year. You know, a, a lot of what we do in training isn't as much about the individual, it's about the social consequences. We need people occupied. We need them occupied now, actually. You know, I, I look out onto a park and today I've seen 40 to 60 youngsters, not social distancing, just outside of my laptop. Yeah, it's amazing. I haven't gone out and sorted them. Right. But it's, um, you know, we need to do something now. And that's that's the justification. You know why we're asking. We're not actually asking for loads more money when it turns out. Um, so so, you know, don't don't be shy with your ambition. The not doing it is far worse money wise and for people's sanity. Well, luckily for those young people, we're keeping you occupied this afternoon, Sue. Stephen, I understand uh, you want to come in, but I want to ask you, Stephen, if, if you've got any uh, idea around the number of people or, or how often it's been used, uh, how, how many people have used the opportunity of furlough to train, so to access any particular courses uh, and bits and pieces. I think it was something that you know, came out in the early days of furlough, that if you, if you are training, you can do all of these wonderful free courses that are out there. But I don't hear much discussion about that any longer. I wondered if Learning and Work Institute have some thoughts on that. 
I think it's a bit of a data gap, to be honest. So um, if anyone does want to fund a quick survey of that, uh, we are available um, to help. Um, I guess you, you might get some of it through um, government figures on take up of courses, but it tends to be quite a lag on that. You might get it through business surveys um, as they come through. I'm not aware of anything so far, um, to be honest. So it's a really important question. Uh, and I did just want to pick up on the because it does link onto the cost benefit point um, and I declare an interest as a former Treasury official here who's been keeping a, a running total of the uh, uh, vast array of sectors on the news arguing that their sector is very very special and deserves more investment above and beyond the government's emergency um, support that it's already provided. I, I do think it's an important question um, because you don't just have to um, show that your scheme or whatever it is or your priority has a better benefit cost ratio or has a positive cost benefit ratio you have to show it's better than other things as well now I think the slight difference here I think Sue is correct um, is that this is such a catastrophic situation that it's probably better to over invest than under invest so the normal times rules have probably changed a bit and we are shelling out 14 billion a month on the uh, coronavirus job retention scheme so a couple of billion here and there doesn't seem like so much anymore um, but I, but I think we, there are some places where we have a very clear um, business case, if you like. So things like jobs guarantees where they're targeted in particular ways and well designed, they do work. Employment programmes work. Getting people up to level three and, and improve their base skill. All these things, we know that they have a big benefit to individuals, to the economy, to society as well. Um, so I think this is a time, that's what I was saying before, really. Let's not just be tied to small tweaks here or there or come have a bit more for this program i think we can be more ambitious and say what do we want the future to look like not just how do we deal with the immediate problems that have spiked up now and that's why i think that probably the world has changed and we can be more ambitious on these things but we do have to be as evidence-based as we can and we have to recognize that uh, outside the treasury there is an enormous socially distanced queue of um, particular people arguing that their sector It'd be even more enormous now because of social distancing, actually, um, like, like voting in the Houses of Parliament. Um, you know, so there is a fast queue there um, and we can't just say we're the only special ones. Um, but actually, this is a time when we can do more than one thing as a country um, because we've got more than one thing to respond to. So let's be positive and let's be ambitious and let's build on that evidence base as well. And before I bring this section to a conclusion, David, uh, who has transported himself into a new environment uh, with lovely curtains. David, uh, they did arrived. I think it was better upstairs than uh, having a few more people on the Zoom call. <laughs> Does that help answer your question at all? Do you have any additional comments? Yeah, I mean, that, that broadly was my, my, my view. I wanted to really hear if there were any, uh, any differing views on the matter. Um, I certainly agree with Laura's point on the chat around, I think the ask needs to be simple and broad rather than lots of small separate asks. Um, so yeah, no, thank you for that. Super. Okay, so um, we will now move on to the next section, which is apprenticeships. Um, I do appreciate that this uh, Zoom roundtable was scheduled to finish at quarter past uh, three. Uh, the benefit of it being virtual is there's no uh, awkwardness if you now need to get up and <laughs> move on to your next meeting. So uh, do if you've got to head off, I uh, totally appreciate uh, you giving up your time already uh, for the past hour and a half. So, uh, you know, feel free to drop out uh, and, and don't feel like you need, you need to send your apologies and thanks. So um, we will now move on to the apprenticeship section uh, and I'd like to invite Mark and Sue to provide their brief introduction. Well, should I start, Sue, on, on this one? Uh, the uh, paper does have a few paragraphs about the UK apprenticeship levy, which is obviously a business tax. And um, I think the first point to say is that the levy has not operated even in a mild downturn, let alone a V-shaped or wheelbarrow recession. The first three years it operated in quite benign economic circumstances. Employee growth, which is a key determinant of uh, what the levy will raise, and some nominal wage growth. And actually, uh, Stephen will be pleased, um, what, H, what the OBR that will probably ex-Treasury as well, predicted that the uh, levy would bring in over those first three years, it more or less brought in 
give or take 400 million pounds, which is not a bad margin for a tax when you're modeling a tax three or four uh, years out. I think we know that there is a UK review of the apprenticeship levy. I think given that the report was April, I keep reminding myself of April, I think the report says that review should be stopped and restarted afresh completely because the way in which the levy will operate going forward, we could expect a completely different distribution of levy payers. We could have some current levy payers becoming non-levy payers. We could have some levy payers who go bust, they're just not around, and yet it could be much more dominated by public sector levy payers. And of course in England, we all know that we have this digital account system. So digital accounts may well be switched on and off because um, some employers are no longer with us, but there might be more uh, of the levy raised, uh, especially by the NHS, for example. I've just looked at the monthly levy collection for April 2020. It was 210 million, provisional estimate by the HMRC. The year before, it was 270 million, and the year before that, it was 270 million. So um, I think in England, we have probably now got the fact that there isn't that much of a relationship between the levy in England and the English apprenticeship program budget. They don't align, it's over two or three years. But I think the second point is, only three months ago, we were really worried that the apprenticeship program budget would be bust. My sense is that the program budget this year, financial year 2021, there'll be an underspend. So one of the questions will be, if we wish, for example, to use uh, find money for wage subsidies for 19 to 24 year olds or increase the level of wage subsidies, are we going to use the apprenticeship budget for less on provision and assessment and more in terms of um, wage subsidies? I would have thought there are so many big fundamental questions on the uh, programme budget in England for apprenticeships uh, would be, um, you know, it, some very big strategic issues need to be decided. I would say there's another point that we made in the report um, uh, on the basis that perhaps for 16 to 18 year olds, we need a single education and apprenticeship participation budget to allow DFE to switch between different types of provision, whether that's traineeships or more full-time education, because I think I've always tried to argue, look, we have a very small number of 16, 17 year olds on apprenticeships. It could be even lower, but that money may need to be redeployed uh, elsewhere. Uh, and finally, there's always a debate in our world, uh, and this will bring Nick in, about level seven MBA type apprenticeships. And the debate three months ago would be there, um, the question of, busting the apprenticeship budget. I don't think the funding issue is such an issue anymore, but it still opens the question whether we should be using funding for that type of apprenticeship. So that's my kind of um, uh, summary on the apprenticeship, Shane. Thank you, Mark. Um, and given uh, we're, we're on apprenticeships, um, I'm gonna quickly ask for Simon Ashworth, AELP, to provide a few comments, uh, and then I'll move over to John uh, from New College Durham. Simon. Really in interesting comments there for, for, from Mark, you know, and the pressure on the, the levy is uh, getting more intense, certainly for, for, from business. I think one of the challenge when you open up the levy to, to spend on anything else, then it's very difficult to put the cork back in the bottle. You know, we've got um, a three billion pounds of the National Skills Fund just around the corner where um, maybe that could be, be, be used. Um, so in terms of some of the other points that Mark made, I mean, the six, 16 to 18 guarantee is, is a no brainer. I mean, it, sh it, it shouldn't be funded by the levy, it should be funded by, by government. I think um, we, we, we don't find anyone who, who disagrees with that. Uh, I think this more widely on apprenticeships, you know, there's two strands really. There's the um, incentivizing recruitment of, of young people through uh, employer incentives. But also the key point really is about retention as well, uh, retaining people um, so they, don't, they don't, don't, don't get displaced. So again, looking at some other for forms of uh, incentives. 
And then the, the, the kind of group that have struggled most, uh, kind of even before COVID-19, has been SMEs. Uh, and you look at the, the recruitment numbers that are coming through, it's, it's young people are dropping off a cliff. And SMEs are also struggling with uh, investing in apprenticeships with a co-investment. So there's, there's, there's a range of things where the government could quite easily sort of flex and provide some support. But, uh, and then the kind of point, I guess, on the, the level seven, and uh, you know, kind of I'll probably started some of this controversy a while ago by by putting it out there as uh, you know should level six and seven be funded through through the uh, through the levy? Um, in essence, it, it it is about employer choice. Um, an employer should have that choice, and I think employers have told that. You know, the tipping point comes when the, we run out of budget, or, or, or you know, and then we have to make those sort of hard choices and. Uh, we are in a strange time of having a, a two years of underspend and then uh, potentially an overspend, which, which might go away in the short term. So it, it, um, it, it's a strange short of time, but um, food for thought, definitely. Thank you, Simon. And John, coming in from uh, an Aussie college perspective. Yeah, it might be slight a lot with what Simon says. So I take the point about not, you want, once you take some money out of one pot, it's very difficult to replenish it then in the future. It's too tempting, I think. The civil servants and I say that with so many ex-civil servants sat around in the meeting um, so you, you know because you've probably done it but I think this is not the time to get hung up with bureaucracy so you've got things like the national retraining scheme you've got the adult education budgets and someone said before you know there's money in the system so I think one of the challenges is to make sure that money is deployed in the right place and we have set up sort of for adult education quite a complex system where you've got you know mayoral authorities have got some influence now over adult ed you've got various national schemes that either complement or overreach that scheme uh, and it is very very difficult to navigate through i think one of the issues from a provider perspective probably not so in fe college perspective some of sue's people and one of my other hats as well with the wea some providers are going to find it very difficult to survive in this environment and yet they're just the ones who are going for these hard to get at adult learners and they've got lots of experience, lots of networks. We've got to find some way of sustaining that. And you know, and, and it would be a real shame if just the paperwork got in the way. And Laura Jane from Way UK has made an interesting point around you know, actually congratulating the government for doing its job in terms of a marketing campaign and the popular the rise in the popularity of apprenticeships. But of course, we're now going to be in a position where a lot of young people will be looking for an apprenticeship and there is no vacancy available. Laura, did you want to expand on, on that point? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing so many young people come to our career site for content, advice about apprenticeships, what pathways are there. Young people are really invested. The message has got through. They're talking to their parents about choosing to do an apprenticeship. My my 15 year old wants to do a degree apprenticeship after his A-level options. You know, he's not talked about going to university and he's had no careers advice at school. So somewhere, somehow these messages have really got through. Now, if when it comes to him looking and to this cohort of young people looking for that apprenticeship to, to make that move after full time education and they're not available, that will also quickly undo all of that great activity that has happened. And we'll be back where we were five years ago asking ourselves, how the hell do we get young people interested in apprenticeships? So unless we find a way to stimulate SMEs to want to take on apprentices in their local areas across all levels, we are going to really lose the interest of young people very, very quickly. And that, I think that'll be really even more damaging. And, and Nick, from a HE perspective, um, obviously Simon um, mentioned uh, higher education within sort of degree apprenticeship levels. What, any discussions happening there at the moment within the HE settings? Um, I mean, there always are, but I don't think the crisis has particularly changed them. I mean, there are those uh, conversations about MBA ones, as you mentioned, and there's, as you know, one or two universities that have got heavily involved in the apprenticeship space. But my sense is the current crisis has led them to think a lot about international students, a lot about research funding, a lot about, as John and I were saying about before, about sort of ELQ rules and short term courses. I haven't. I, d I think, if I'm completely honest, I, have, I don't think I've had a conversation with the university about apprenticeships specifically since the crisis began. That may be my failing or it may be their failing, but, but I, I, I don't think it's been near the top of their concerns about the impact of the pandemic on education. And, uh, and, and um, um, 
so yeah there are probably fewer maybe so perhaps fewer conversations of that sort than you might imagine interesting simon did you want to respond on that at all well i suppose that's probably a different sort of message i mean we've got a number of uh, heis who are members with with um with alp and um you know they see your friendship as a, a massive opportunity you know decline in, in international students uh, a, a big pot of money with the the apprenticeship levy so Far, far from it, you know, we've got a record number of HEIs on the on the apprenticeship register. We've had the, the non-levy um, apprenticeship service opened up, so they've got access to, to non-levy funding. Um, so it, certainly the, the HEIs we're talking to are, are, are certainly moving into this space and they see it as an opportunity to um, to, to supplement or, 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 or refill some of the income they might lose from, from, from other traditional uh, streams. And it, just, just another point to throw in really, um, no one's really talked much too much about uh, pre-apprenticeships or pre-apprenticeship program that you know there's been some rumors swilling around about a, a return to program-led apprenticeships uh, PLAs um, I'm, I'm sure people can rem remember those um, you know as an alternative and, and the, you know the key thing is about uh, it, making sure it's employer-led and you know they're the kind of key assets really of the apprenticeship program uh, but that, that uh, those, those sort of rumours have come from various um, different sources. But uh, so there's definitely some thinking about some sort of stimulus. But we just need to be very careful about um, uh, some of the lessons we've learned in the past, uh, where where people might do 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 courses, but don't necessarily le lead to an apprenticeship off the back of it. Thank you, Simon. I'm just going to bring in Michael, uh, and then I'll invite Sue and uh, Mark to to make their their closing remarks, if any. Michael. Michael from NCFE, are you there? Yeah, sorry. Hi, Shane. I just uh, I just had trouble getting myself off mute there. It's just a very, very quick point on apprenticeships that no, that no one's really raised yet. And that's uh, over the last few years, we've seen a, an ever increasing amount of um, companies using existing staff members to become their apprentices. And I think anything that happens in this space, policymakers need to be aware that really what they're looking for is to stimulate those new opportunities for people entering a workforce because um, I think it's I don't want to say open to abuse, but I think you know we we could end up with an unintended consequence of just making it easier to to convert more existing members of staff, which doesn't really do a lot to to solve some of the the issues that we've been talking about today. Thank you. Okay, and now I'd like to invite Sue and Mark to make their final uh, comments. I I don't, I don't want to be doom and gloom at the end of this conversation, but I think I will be. I don't. I think we're underestimating the size of the unemployment position in the autumn. I mean, I actually live in Crawley by Gatwick Airport. Over 50% of people in Crawley are unemployed now. That's not with the furlough workers, that's with the unemployed. There is no apprenticeship offer um, at all for the new employee. Um, and that's where I think we, we sort of have to recognise that we need a replacement um, and it's going to be probably bigger than we thought. And I, I'm sort of in the space with Simon. I know some universities do see this as a growth area, but they see it as offering apprenticeships to existing employees at the higher levels, where actually we need to use the money at the lower level, level two or level three, to stimulate people getting a job, giving that money to the employer so that they will take on a new entrant. And that's what's not happening. And I doubt whether it'll happen for 18 months. Thank you. And, and Mark, uh, quick final remarks, please. I think all leaders around the world are Keynesians. Can't do anything on monetary policy. It's all fiscal policy. It's the balance between tax cuts and public spending. I think that this Chancellor and this Prime Minister get it. They know that there is going to be something massive happen on the 1st of November. And that's what they've got their eyes on. And I think everyone is right about the scale about mass unemployment. Uh, I can remember it in the 80s. We don't want to go back to that. And uh, it could be disproportionate in the North, but then there will be areas in the South. I, I think this government get it. I think this Chancellor gets it, and I don't think we should, at this stage, worry about the cost and the debt. Uh, we'll treat it like World War II debt, we won't treat it like austerity. And from what I read in the Telegraph, <laughs> that uh, Treasury officials don't see this recession like financial uh, uh, crash, 
They see this as just something different. And I think if that's the mentality, we should, a, a simple ask post 16, but a significant ask because it's justified. And I'm hopeful, always. Thank you. But I, th I think certainly ac across many of the newspapers, uh, national newspapers, there, there does seem to be an understanding that the fiscal rules within Treasury have sort of been rewritten in response to this. So once we've hit a certain level against GDP, well, who cares? Let's go for it all. Uh, and, and to borrow at the moment is relatively cheap in comparison. I'm afraid that brings us to an end uh, to this uh, roundtable session. I think we could have gone on for another couple of hours. Uh, we need to keep Sue occupied so she leaves the young people alone outside in her, the park in front of her home. Um, but for now, everybody, thank you very much for taking part in today's uh, session. And for those watching on the recording, thank you for watching. If you want to take part in the discussion, please do uh, visit the FE Week website where you can leave a comment at the end of this article. And also the report is available on the web address, which is on your screens now. Thank you very much.